So one of the um, one of the things I'd like to to, to talk about today is um, practice of meditation and uh, what meditation is um, and what I at least I I think is not um, meditation and to encourage you to be um, vigilant uh, and to be careful not to let uh, like worldly gaining ideas um, infect your understanding of meditation because uh, meditation is a, is a mirror um, to our life and the world and it's a standing back from all of our usual um, struggles and fears and desires. Um, but it can very easily become you know, another self-centered project and uh, can become uh, rather narrow. And <clears throat> it's important, I believe, to um, understand meditation within the whole context of the Buddhist teachings. And when Buddhist meditation techniques are taken out of their context, they um, can be um, useful, and certainly those who profess other religions have expressed appreciation for um, their adoption of, of certain Buddhist uh, techniques. But at the same time, uh, uh, the danger is that it uh, becomes a kind of an organic or um, toxic-free uh, kind of relaxation uh, method. Um, and the there is, certainly there should be um, uh, a relaxation of stress and tension arising from the application of Buddhist meditation techniques, but that's not the goal. That's a, that's a, a rather refreshing byproduct, but it shouldn't become the main uh, purpose for uh, Buddhist meditation. As from a Buddhist point of view. Um, stress uh, and tension in our life uh, may be pacified whether by a pill or uh, by a concentration exercise but that um, ultimately we have to be developing the, um, the intelligence the skills um, to be able to look at the causes and conditions of that stress and to deal with things at their, in their root causes, but with the recognition that our ability to look within and to uh, recognize the um, <clears throat> harmful thoughts and perceptions and habits of mind which underlie our daily suffering is not possible without um, some uh, consistent and generally quite long-term uh, commitment to an inner training or inner education. So if we, if we look on meditation as a means to an end, as a means to get rid of um, the kinds of mental states or the stress and the tension which <clears throat> causes so much suffering, then what tends to happen is that after some period of time, we, we do experience some success in that. And then we tend to uh, just sort of rest back in that and relax, you know, we've achieved our goal. Um, and then the mind goes to sleep and often the body goes to sleep as well. And that's why 
uh, sleepiness and dullness is such a, a major problem for many meditators <clears throat> because they um, they have conceived of peace of mind um, as a sort of a dull, contentless, um, meaning lacking uh, content um, state of mind, and uh, having reach that state of mind, they, they stop their, their practice. The, the way of looking at meditation, approaching meditation, which I feel is, is uh, much more ha uh, helpful, is to see it as a form of education. In our daily life, we create problems for ourselves, usually um, or often without realizing we're doing it, and often, as a result of that lack of awareness, we blame uh, conditions and other people for that. <clears throat> Sometimes we're aware of what we're doing, but we just can't help, help ourselves. And we feel this gap between how we feel we should be and how we are. And looking at life in, in terms of that, setting yourself goals of who you should be and how you should be, and then being un unable to live up to those standards um, is a surefire formula for guilt. So you have like whole cultures racked with guilt because people are not who they think they should be. The Buddhism says you shouldn't, you know, don't get caught up in an idea of who you should be, but um, look at um, what's going on right now and how to deal with it. So <clears throat> in meditation, we don't want to, you know, have this idea of, gaining a particular mental state and then we can or a particular experience uh, and then we've accomplished our meditative goals and all we have to do is is care for that and protect it and prevent it prevent it from um, <clears throat> disappearing so this is uh, an example of what I call this worldly attitude to to, to meditation um, we create problems for ourselves without realizing it. Uh, we create problems for ourselves, um, although we realize we're doing so because, but because we can't help ourselves. Uh, we create problems for ourselves just sometimes out of, out of spite or out of in spite against ourselves. And that's only if we have a very self-destructive a streak in our character where we deliberately do things that we know are harmful and we want to punish ourselves because perhaps we think we're bad people. So we have a lot of um, mixed up, inconsistent and um, mistaken views about ourselves. And these um, views and perceptions and ideas about ourselves and about lives don't go away by reciting a mantra or being able to uh, forget your problems for, um, for a few minutes or half an hour uh, by application of a meditation technique. What meditation can do is that it allows us um, to enter um, a state of mind which is stable and bright and clear and, and, and gives us a feeling of of safety and the one in which we can look at the mind more clearly and develop um, some very important life skills which we uh, would be hard put to. I don't think it'd be possible to, de uh, to develop these skills without this um, looking within and giving time to this process of inner education or training. So the kind of life skills I'm talking about here are, are when we um, give the mind some work to do, let's say um, to uh, be aware of an object or aware of the breath, then by that intention to uh, restrict our attention to one particular object or theme, then everything else that's going on in our minds uh, becomes illuminated, it becomes revealed as not what I'm trying to do. 
So we, we create a, a very useful duality here by choosing to um, focus on one thing, then everything else which is clamoring for attention becomes revealed in a new light as a distraction. And we begin to see mental states as mental states rather than uh, who we are. So this is a, a radical departure from our usual life. Certainly we, we can experience um, moral uh, conflicts in life where there's something that we want to do and we don't do it. And, and that creates, as we know, some, some real strength of character, but it can also create um, rigidity and, uh, <clears throat> and prejudice in, in the human mind. But here, looking within and focusing on, for example, the breath, then we begin to see how the mind is continually jumping out at the present moment or grasping on to something, anything, um, as, uh, as company or as to, to keep our mind um, away from the awareness of itself. So there's, there's an, almost nothing, I would think, that the human mind, the untrained human mind, fears as much as itself. <clears throat> so we're really very, very much going against the stream, going against the, the stream of our culture, the stream of our habits, and we're saying we're not just going to uh, follow along or blindly push against um, the conditions that we're experiencing, but we're developing the ability to, to stand there and look and learn and distinguish and discriminate as to what kinds of things we want to uh, support and nourish in our lives and what kind of things we, we need, we recognize uh, we need the tools um, to reduce and eventually eliminate. So the, the first task in meditation is we adopt a meditation object and then we try to uh, sustain our attention on an object. So in the first stages of meditation, basically what we're trying to do is increase our attention span. Um, and as we know, generally speaking, um, attention spans uh, in our modern world are getting shorter and shorter and shorter. So I think for purposes of basic mental health, having a regular practice of lengthening the attention span um, is without any other um, benefits uh, a good thing to do. But the lengthening um, the attention span um, is uh, something that creates um, some, some amount of turmoil in the mind because the mind's not used to it. And we begin to notice that there is a tendency for the mind to grasp onto some pleasant memory or some pleasant uh, uh, scene or um, imagined um, scenario in the future. So we thoughts of the past, thoughts of the future, we grasp onto or we create um, as a as a kind of a teddy bear, you know, or Linus's blanket. You know, we just want something just to give us just a little bit of comfort, just enough comfort to get us through the next few seconds, and then we can grasp onto something else. So this is a um, very deeply ingrained habit of mind, which we can observe when we don't follow it. How is the moment the mind calms down, isn't it? We want to grasp onto something else, something that just gives us just a little spurt, just a, just a little feeling of excitement or interest or newness, novelty, um, comfort. So we're, we're feeling a little bit depressed or down. What does the mind do? If there's no means of external escape by um, getting on our smartphones or or going somewhere or buying something or or whatever, then we, we seek to escape internally by by trying to bring into the mind some pleasant um, memory or some pleasant fantasy. Another habit 
that we observe is that um, the mind can very easily um, just fall into um, a habit and a tendency um, to uh, reject and push away or to um, react with, with anger and um, indignation. So in a meditation um, session, you might suddenly find out of nowhere um, a thought of uh, something somebody did or something somebody said which you found outrageous and you're, and you're boiling up and you just go over and over it in your mind. Or you're very negative about yourself or um, you're frustrated at your inability to meditate and your inability to uh, really pursue this as far as or as um, profoundly as you would like to. So what we're trying to do in meditation is a very important life skill is to stand back from the content of thoughts and see thoughts and emotions as process. As generally speaking, we, we're so caught up in the content of what's going in our mind that we're blind to the process. And seeing the process is liberating, caught in the content is not. And so we can very easily um, spend minutes even in a meditation uh, just dwelling on all the reasons why we dislike someone and all this drudging up all the things they've said and done. Once the mind goes on a, on a jag or it gets into a rut, then it, <coughs> then, it, then it goes with it. You know, there's a whole long riff um, of negativity. And seeing how negativity arises and, and how, how the mind responds to a negative thought, to the extent to which it runs with it and the extent with which it indulges in it, this is important information because this tendency is not something that suddenly appeared when you meditate. What you're doing is you're becoming aware in a very controlled environment, inner environment, of things that are going along, going on in your life every day. Uh, but given the, uh, the amount of things that you have to deal with, the amount of responsibilities you have, you're unable to isolate. So we can compare these negative or toxic uh, mental states, mental habits to um, viruses um, that are invisible to the naked eye, but which can be seen under a microscope in a, in a laboratory. So we're making our minds our, our laboratory, and the meditation is, is uh, um, analogous to creating or making use of a microscope, and we're going to say, oh yes. And so the information we have and the um, the growing familiarity with how these negative mental states arise enable us to become more aware in our daily life so that there is this symbiotic what's called osmosis between experiences in daily life and meditation, meditation and daily life. Then there's an, another um, uh, kind of um, men negative mental state, what we call, a, technically speaking, a hindrance to meditation. And that is the whole area of, of dullness and sleepiness and so on. I, I mentioned this um, a few minutes ago that dullness and meditation in meditation is often the result of a wrong idea about meditation and um, an indulgence in the sense of relaxation that arises when the mind uh, transcends, at least temporarily, um, the agitation, which is where most meditation sessions begin. It's also um, uh, also observable, I think, that if you're the kind of person, and this tends to be men more than women, who find emotion threatening and just tend to shut down or stonewall or walk out the room whenever anything um, uh, emotional uh, is, is on the horizon, then this is also reflected in meditation when you're in, you start to get into some more uh, unsettling or um, unusual um, areas of experience, then the mind can just shut down and go to sleep. And so if that happens a lot in meditation, then that's a good indication that you're probably uh, reacting to situations in the world in the same way and gives you some 
um, some insight into problems in your daily life also. Um, the the uh, the amount of sleepiness and dullness of mind which arises is also uh, related um, to the extent to which you are uh, addicted to stimulation. Uh, we live in a very stimulating world, and uh, stimulation, even the more benign kinds of stimulation, is still at the end of the day it's stimulation. And if our sense of well-being and interest and, and vitality in life is dependent on stimulation from outside of ourselves, then as soon as that stimulation is removed or reduced, the mind becomes uh, lax, its vitality becomes dull. So we, we consciously choose a meditation in, um, object which is neutral, it's not exciting. The sensation of the breath is not something which will fill you with excitement. But that's precisely the point, um, because we're interested to see um, just to what extent we have inner resources and to what extent our whole sense of well-being and who we are and our sense of purpose in life and our sense of being alive is dependent on uh, constant bursts of stimulation through our eyes, our ears, our nose, our tongues, our bodies, and so on. So. Um, all of these hindrances are also teachers. They're also um, allowing us to understand ourselves more clearly, but also um, seeing them in this very controlled and artificial environment um, allows us to see the whole structure underlying them and gives us ideas about how to deal with them effectively and, and eliminate them not only from the meditation practice or meditation experience, but from daily life. The other, uh, the next um, hindrance to meditation is, is that of agitation um, and guilt and anxiety. So agitation is usually compared to the monkey mind. It's the mind which is jumping from one thing to another uh, in a completely wild, abandoned kind of way. And this, the um, coming face to face with mental agitation um, is a sobering experience, uh, one that every meditator um, has to pass through. And often the, the hope is that there is some kind of special uh, magic bullet, some uh, esoteric uh, teaching which will um, wipe out the agitation in, a, um, in one foul swoop and leave the mind uh, free to explore a more um, profound and peaceful um, areas of the psyche, but that doesn't, it doesn't work like that. And the uh, mental agitation that arises is again um, also as much a teacher as an obstacle. If, um, if your life is more or less in, in some kind of balance, you will have some mental agitation, but a um, consistent and patient approach to meditation will reduce it um, radically and the time that you, you struggle with agitation in meditation will, will gradually diminish. <coughs> but if your life is, is really unbalanced and you've taken on far more than you can handle and you're, um, you're just working too many hours, um, spending too much time on, on trivial um, un, uh, unhelpful pursuits, um, then you're, in your daily life, you are feeding uh, your agitation in a way that tends to outstrip the efforts in meditation to reduce the agitation. So there's, there's no harmony between the outer and the inner. So once you, you really see the value, or you're, you're inspired with the, the quest um, for um, spiritual truth and, and inner peace and wisdom, then your attitude to your external uh, life um, starts to change somewhat. And, and this is a new criteria that comes to bear on your decision making. Not only is it things, well, will this, um, you know, will this be successful? Will it be 
financially productive? Will um, <clears throat> what will it do for my career? All these kinds of, of um, criteria. But supplementing that is um, what will it do to my mind? Um, how can I handle that? You know, am I am I able to deal with that kind of extra stress and tension that may well come with it? Also, the um, uh, perhaps uh, immediately the more um, potent kind of reflections is the amount of time we spend on um, entertainments and um, and trivial pursuits. Um, you know, then we start to look into just what do we get out of it? You know, do we really get as much pleasure and happiness out of these things as we like to think we do? Let's be honest here. Um, and it, a lot of our experiences um, are similar to uh, junk food. You know, as it always, in, instead of satisfying sense of hunger, um, it increases it, and and we carry around this sort of sense of restlessness, something not quite right, something missing, something I need something more. So uh, struggles in meditation to deal with the agitated mind. Um, uh, allow us to, or encourage us to, um, have a second look, a new look, to recognize our daily life, both in terms of the necessary commitments we make to family and to career, but also the, uh, the semi-necessary or unnecessary uh, commitments of time and effort we make to things that we assume uh, create enjoyment and pleasure in our life, but perhaps don't uh, do what they're cracked up to be in the way that we would like to think. The, um, the second um, side of this uh, hindrance <coughs> excuse me, is um, guilt and anxiety. This is uh, much reduced by giving care and attention to the quality of your actions and speech in daily life. Um, but also, um, I think that we can we can often observe that we we carry things around with us, memories of acts um, of omission and commission, things that we we feel were were wrong, were bad, and they and we carry them around for years even, and. Um, if we were to ask ourselves the question, could we let go of that memory? Then perhaps we can say yes, and then ask ourselves, well, why don't we? And then we feel it wouldn't quite be right. There's this need to, we feel a need to punish ourselves for uh, foolish and hurtful things we've done in the past. And somehow by letting go of our our memory and our anguish about those actions that we're betraying our better self or that we're getting off scot-free and it wouldn't be right and somehow that it's more virtuous to suffer because of the foolish things that we've said and done in the past. So it's significant here that the Buddha says that that kind of view is, is a mental hindrance, it's a defilement, um, it's unwise. And it's not ethical, moral, or virtuous to do that. And the um, one way of looking at this topic is to is to contrast um, shame and guilt. So shame is also a word which is very saddled with all kinds of um, perceptions and and uh, prejudices in, um, in 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 this culture. But the the Pali word or the Buddhist concept is of a sense of um, deep um, incongruity or a, a, or a sense that certain kinds of action and speech are in conflict with or betray our principles, our goals, our ideals. And when we clearly recognize this conflict, then a sense of shame arises. And it's a sense of, uh, it, it's the emotional counterpart to the recognition of a 
conflict between action and aspiration or action and values. So in the in the, the Buddhist concept there is no sense of I am a bad person because I've done bad things or I should be punished or I should punish myself. Uh, there's a recognition of uh, foolish, misguided, um, uh, harmful actions of body and speech and that the recognition of them as such, taking responsibility for them and making a sincere effort to prevent them occurring again that, in the Buddhist sense, is the purification. Um, and anything on top of that is self-indulgence. So going over and over um, the past, um, and we've all acted foolishly and hurtfully and harmfully in the past, I'm sure. But the sense, what, what, should our, what is the correct relationship that we should seek to create between our present self and our past selves? And and our present life and all the lives and the, um, the people that we've been just in the past 20, 30, 40 years, because we're all so, so many different people, you know, all in, all, in one, all in one shell or one body. So this is something that we're seeking to work out in meditation, to what extent we're, we're carrying unnecessary burdens. And uh, one of Ajahn Chah's favorite uh, famous teachings is uh, is this kind of a story of someone who's carrying a big rock on their back and they're struggling along and they're sweating and they're aching and they're hurting and and someone comes along and says, "Well, why? What's wrong?" I said, "Oh, this rock. It's just so heavy. It's bearing me down. It's so painful." I said, "Well, why don't you just put it down?" I said, well, yeah. Well, then I wouldn't have anything to carry. Yeah. So, so that, that, that's the, the, the logic there, yeah. I, mean, I could put it down, but I don't want to because I just can't imagine um, what it does. wouldn't feel right not to be carrying something like that. So this is an area which we're learning about in meditation. So I'm trying to convey this idea of meditation not as the application of a technique in order to gain some sort of special state, maybe like a, a peaceful, blissful, um, refuge from all the mess and the um, unsatisfactoriness of daily life, but as a means of um, of creating the stability and clarity and um, peace that enables us to learn from experience and to live more wisely. The <clears throat> the last of the hindrances is uh, called skeptical doubt. Now, um, Buddhism is not a, a belief system in the way that most of the major religious uh, religions of the world is, and I characterize it as essentially an education system. That being the case, the role and function of faith in Buddhism is very different from that where we find in the belief system family of religions. And um, faith in uh, in Buddhism is not given the, the, the central role, it's not the most important virtue by any means. Um, it is a virtue because it focuses and clarifies the mind, gives the mind effort and uh, energy and focus, but it, it also has to be governed by the wisdom faculty. Lacking the wisdom faculty, um, the emotion, the, the energy of faith, uh, can very easily uh, become fanaticism uh, or superstition. So faith is looked, at, looked on as a tool to be used in this education, but one which has to be closely governed by wisdom to prevent it um, degenerating into fanaticism or superstition. Um, similarly, uh, doubt has a different... Doubt is not seen as the kind of the bogeyman or some some terrible thing, and if you doubt, you're, you know, you're on your way to hell. But, um, doubt is divided into um, intelligent doubt and unintelligent doubt. Intelligent doubt is um, can be um, the idea of intelligent doubt can be conveyed by um, 
an episode in the Buddha's lifetime. He uh, was uh, walking and traveling, teaching um, far to the west of, of the middle country where he usually dwelled, in an area near to what, um, what is present-day Delhi, so in the center of India. And he met, uh, and he met a group of people um, called the Kalamas. And these Kalamas were, were confused. They said there's so many different teachers and gurus and, and uh, religious authorities come through our, our town and, and, and every one of these teachers, they're so articulate, they're so convincing, their logic seems unassailable. And they all say, um, only my teaching is right and everyone else's is wrong. And so we, we get full of faith in this um, one particular teacher, and then he's gone a few days and someone else comes along and teaches something completely different, but it's equally convincing, equally charismatic, equally wonderful. Um, and then we start to, uh, some of us start to believe in this teaching. So what we would like is some kind of a criteria. How do you know, you know, with all these uh, people who know so much more about spiritual life than we do, you know, how, how, how can you decide um, which is who is who is and which is trustworthy? <coughs> and the Buddha said, um, you are doubting, Kalamas, uh, and you are doubting about things which deserve to be doubted. So he's saying that this is a rational doubt. And, and in this case, the doubt is, is coming from a recognition that we lack the information, we lack the skills to be able to make wise choices. So that that area of doubt is is uh, not at all to, criticized in, in in Buddhist teaching, and um, I, I won't go into the whole of the Kalama Sutta. You can um, you can study this for yourself. But the um, in, in short, the Buddha is in the, the psychological changes that take place um, through the uh, the following of any religious teaching or system. Um, are the internal and reliable indicators of its um, trustworthiness or its or its value. So, um, if the uh, the amount of greed and anger and hatred and delusion um, increases, and the amount of uh, kindness and wisdom and compassion uh, decreases, then that's not a good teaching. Uh, no matter what it might be called, and no matter what authority recommends it, and vice versa, if following um, a tradition, find that the um, kindness, generosity, integrity, uh, patience, peace, wisdom increase, and the negative qualities decrease, then that's a good sign that it's uh, a useful and valid teaching. Uh, so the Buddha didn't say, uh, just forget all those and just believe in me, uh, far from it. Now, in meditation practice, doubt comes up, and in the case that it's um, a valid doubt, um, then teachers, teachers like me, for instance, um, always try to make uh, time for questions and answers sessions at the end of any meeting, um, so that people can express and um, these kind of uh, valid and intelligent doubts and. Uh, Request for clarification of anything which is unclear, or uh, request for the teacher to expand upon something which has been expressed too succinctly. Um, <clears throat> but there is a, the other kind of doubt which is considered a hindrance to meditation. That arises when uh, we start to uh, waver in the midst of, right in the midst of a meditation. You, you, start to apply a technique and after a few minutes it's not working and then maybe I should try this or maybe I should try that or is this really um, worthwhile is it you know I'm spending a lot of time on this I could maybe be um, I could maybe be windsurfing or, or um, surfing the net and some kind of surfing um, is it really worth the time and the effort that I'm expending upon it and so on and so forth so there can be Doubts in the teaching, doubts in oneself, any kinds of doubt. These are the crippling doubts. And the, uh, the advice for dealing uh, with this kind of doubt is recognize doubt as doubt. It seems quite straightforward, but 
One of the reasons that we don't usually do that is because when we're doubting about something, the experience, the subjective experiences of that is that we're being very rational and reasonable and intelligent. And so we, we fall for doubt. We follow it. We don't see it uh, as um, a hindrance at all. The, the advice um, here is to be open-minded and to study and learn lots of different paths and approaches, but after a certain period of time has elapsed, make a choice and stick with it for a certain period of time. Uh, it might be three months or six months and say, um, at the end of that period of time, I'll evaluate. But right now, I don't have enough experience of, um, of working with this particular um, teaching um, method to be able to make um, a worthwhile or trustworthy analysis. And I don't want to have to be thinking about this and worrying about this and doubting it every, every day. So I'll just put it all off for a while. And um, my own case, I, I, I went to Thailand when I was 20 years old. I didn't speak Thai. I'd never been in. Uh, I didn't know what monastic life in Thailand was going to be like, um, whether it would be wonderful or awful, bearable, unbearable. But I made a firm determination that come what may, uh, how, whatever experience it was, um, I was going to stay for five years because that's considered the, like the apprenticeship for a, for a forest monk. <clears throat> so I didn't have to be thinking every day, have I made a good choice or a bad choice, or every time I uh, have some problem or difficulty start to waver and doubt. So that very simple method of uh, making a, um, a vow or an aditan or a promise or a commitment um, to... Uh, to pursue something for a certain period of time takes away um, a lot of that doubt. Why does doubt arise? This kind of doubt, often because we want some cast iron uh, guarantees before we invest our time and effort into something. We want to know for sure that it will pay a certain amount of interest at the end of that. And in spiritual life, that's not possible. You can't you can't ever guarantee it. it there's always a risk. So um, using your intelligence, and if there is one, uh, one thing is um, coming back to what we call the, the five precepts. If there's any teaching um, which under any precept, uh, under any pretext, even if it sounds really kind of mystical and cool and so on and so forth, um, but encourages you to, uh, to harm others, or to steal, or to cheat, or to commit sexual misconduct, or to lie, or to take uh, alcohol or other intoxicating drugs, then I would say keep away from it. Um, if the teacher is trying to um, use his uh, charisma, spiritual power to manipulate, take advantage, I mean, then no matter how wonderful his teachings might be, stay away. If there's money involved and financial uh, pressure being put upon you and being told to be a good student, you need to donate so much money, then be very suspicious. Um, so there are certain kind of common sense um, uh, um, limitations here for, you know, what kind of things to, to commit to. But um, given the fact that there's an ethical and moral uh, foundation there, which is blameless, um, then give, uh, give sufficient time to that. <coughs> so I wasn't going to talk for more than a few minutes, and I've been talking for a long time now, but it's it's an um, important um, topic, I think. I've been talking, I've been giving what's really a, a very traditional um, Dhamma Desana, an, ex, um, an exposition of what we call the five hindrances to meditation. And... <coughs> I wanted to uh, to put this meditation in in context in a specifically Buddhist context rather than as a you know particular a generic um, exercise to calm down the mind. So I would like to invite you all to adopt a meditation posture and we'll have a, uh, a meditation um, practice together.